Good morning to those of you that I haven't yet seen. We're in Ezekiel chapter 20 this morning. While you're looking for Ezekiel chapter 20, I had made a promise to the lesson study group that with a larger church together, I would share a little bit about what happened over the last few weeks while I was away in that faraway land called England. And uh, as you know, I went over there to, I was invited to conduct some meetings over there for the, for the um, Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South England Conference. And so basically the area where I was, for those of you that know England, you know where London is. London is on the east coast towards the bottom of England. And so I, I did every, I went to many places south, east and west. I did not go north. England, uh, London was as far north as I went in, in England. And so the first weekend was our main event. We were working with a church called Yeovil. It's a small group. They don't even have their own building. It's just a group of people, a group of Adventists who meet in a local school, really. And um, so the local pastor there wanted us to do something in the community that would be of relevance to those who are struggling with addiction. And so they invited me to come do the Beyond Addiction. So as we did a year and a half or almost two years ago here, we um, did it sort of as a weekend intensive. And we started on Friday night and we went through the whole of the Sabbath like that. We rented a conference venue and it was all sort of laid back and relaxed and um, had a nice lunch together, a good social environment, and then shared the meetings in that context. And I'll tell you one interesting story that came out of that was a week afterwards, um, on the Friday night the next week, okay, I had an opportunity to meet with that same group again. So what happened in the week between those two, the, the main weekend, and then there was a whole week, and then the Friday night I got to meet with that, that group, and I was just doing one-off meetings with different churches, sharing my testimony and so on in different groups. But on the Friday night, we went back to the same group as a sort of a follow-up for them. And so I had been thinking about what I would share with them throughout the week, and I thought, you know, the last part of the Beyond Addiction series, um, uh, segment number 22 out of 22, is dealing with the Sabbath. And the reason we deal with the Sabbath is because, you know, throughout the Beyond Addiction series, we've pa painted this picture that ultimate healing comes from connection with God. When God comes into your life, He heals, He restores, He cleanses, He puts back together, He restores independence, He breaks the power of addiction. And so, obviously, if this is the concept, and what is the Sabbath for? The Sabbath is for a whole day where you quit everything that the world offers you so that you can just focus on that most fundamental relationship in the universe, which is connecting with God, your source of healing. And so as part of the addiction series, I always like to present the Sabbath concept because it is part of the healing journey. But when I arrived there that evening, I watched the people coming in and I recognized them all from the weekend before. I thought, this is good. You know, I don't like to present that one first time to a group because I haven't laid the foundation for it. And sure enough, a mother brings in her young daughter. She must have been her early 20s. And you can take one look at her and know this is not really her scene. She's been brought, if you know what I mean. And so anyway, we started talking. I started talking to her before the meeting. We had supper together first. And it was kind of, uh, you know, she was a little bit, I think, cautious and standoffish and so on. But anyway, um, we came to the meeting. And I, I tell you, for the whole time during supper and everything while we were there, I'm thinking to myself, do I change my topic, you know? Um, because I could do many other things with this group. And is, this, is she really going to catch why we're doing this in the context of addiction? And I'm toying with this idea. I, I, I was pretty sure coming here, this is what I should do. But now I'm willing to change it if it's just for that one person. You know, what should I do? And so eventually I, just, I came to the place where I said, you know what? The Lord knew what we were going to be presenting. And I'm just going to leave it the way it is. You know, by the time we were finished that night, this is the first contact she's had, first of the addiction meeting she's come to. You know, her head looks like she's in a different place. By the time we finished that meeting, she had approached the pastor of the local area to ask him to continue the journey in the Word with her because she saw the connection between her need for healing, connection with God, and the concept of the Sabbath day. And so, you know, I just praise God for that. The, the next day on the Sabbath, the second Sabbath I was there, it was a day of fellowship, which is like our regionals. You know our regionals where we all get together? And I got to present to them the concept of grace and faith and salvation in relationship to and how it affects the problem of addiction. 
You know, the response, that was primarily Seventh-day Adventists. The, the response there, I think, for people, the lights began, began to come on. People who, who had been, I suppose, in the gospel for so long, but they could see afresh how urgent it is that you and I be connected with God in this right-saving relationship by grace through faith. It was an awesome experience. Then the, week, the next week I had off basically and I got to see London, got to go to the British Museum. If you ever go to London, you have to go to the British Museum and take your Bible with you. Because when you walk through this multi-story building, you could be there for three days as far as I'm concerned. I only had half a day. And so you go through these sections. One is Babylon, one is Assyria, one is the, the um, Philistines and so on and so forth, the Egyptians. All these groups that you read about in the Bible. And you see these historical artifacts that have been dug up, things that validate the history of the Bible, the teachings that tell you the scriptures are in fact accurate historically and therefore spiritually as well. So that was, I guess, my personal highlight. And then the last weekend, I just ran two meetings in, um, in another church near London in relation to the subject of addiction. So for those of you that supported me in prayer while I was gone, thank you very much. I think the meetings were quite successful. And uh, we'll see what happens from here going forward. Ezekiel chapter 20 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, will you pour out your spirit upon us? We have a need for you to speak through your word, for us to hear what you're saying, for us to go from the time of Ezekiel to our time, from the people of Ezekiel's time to us and to make application of these things. So draw us into your presence, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, I've entitled the message for this morning, A Heart of Faithfulness. And you will see as we tra travel uh, through the book of Ezekiel, or this chapter in Ezekiel chapter 20, how this is such an important concept. This is the wrong way around. Hopefully we'll get there. Nothing coming through to you there, Lou? Yep, all right. No. Right, I think I found the right button. There we go. Okay, sorry about the delay. You'll see as we go through this chapter, just this one chapter, we're going to go back to the beginning of Ezekiel as well in a moment. And I want to paint the history of these people. The verse that we start with just starts in chapter, chapter 20, verse 1, and it says the following. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord your God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. Make known to them the abominations of their fathers. That's the first four verses of Ezekiel chapter 20. The people of God, the elders of Israel, come to inquire of the prophet, the man of God. What will the Lord say to us? They want to hear the voice of the Lord. And God says, I will not be inquired of you. Isn't that a different picture to what we think of God? God actually says, I'm not going to talk to you. 
Don't we always say, come to God as you are? Don't we always say, bring to God your brokenness and he will hear you? And here in this passage, you almost get the other picture of that. The elders of Israel, the leaders of the people, come to inquire of the Lord. Isn't that what God always wants of us, is to inquire of him? And then he says, I'm not going to talk to you. Oh, and by the way, prophet Ezekiel, tell them why. I'm going to give them the silent treatment. Tell them why I will not be inquired of them. Make known to them the abominations of their fathers. The silence of God in context. Go back with me to chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 1. You'll remember that at the first verse of chapter 20 it said in the seventh year, right? In the seventh year, the elders of the people came to inquire of Ezekiel the prophet, to inquire of God. In the seventh year. In the seventh year of what? Chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chiba, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So Ezekiel begins his book much like Isaiah begins his book. Isaiah begins with that picture of him seeing God high and lifted up. Woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips living amongst a people of unclean lips. And the, uh, the, the angel comes down with the coal off the altar and touches Isaiah's lips. And that whole thing you see in the book of Isaiah there is a picture of how God accepts Isaiah and calls him into the prophetic office. Same thing happens for Ezekiel, very dramatic here. He begins his book by defining, he knows it was such an important day, a day that changed his life. He knows the day, he knows the month, he knows the year. It's the 30th year of such and such a month, on such and such a day, when the Lord appeared to me, Ezekiel says. On the fifth day of the month, verse 2, on which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar, and, at the, hand of the, and, and, the, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Okay, so notice this. There are two timings given in verses 1 and 2 of Ezekiel chapter 1. The one he calls the 30th year, that's when he was called to the prophetic office. But coinciding with the 30th year is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Are you with me? So he refers to the same moment in time under two different descriptions. One is the 30th year and the other one is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Are you with me so far? Yes or no? Okay. Ezekiel was like Samuel. Remember how Samuel was devoted to the priesthood. Because his father was of the priesthood. And so Samuel, when he was born to a mother who had made the oath to give him to the Lord if he would give her a son, she returned Samuel to Eli, and there he grew to become a priest in the house of Eli. But while he was still a young child, this priest was called to the prophetic office. And so Samuel carried both portfolios of priest and of prophet. Yes? Ezekiel is the same thing, just a little further advanced in the years. Ezekiel is a priest, and God adds to his responsibility of priest, which is representing God to the people, by calling him to the prophetic office, which is representing the voice of God to the, to the people. Does that make sense? So these roles overlap. Now, Ezekiel is called in the 30th year, which is also the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Now, there is one date in the Bible that you and I can pin down with absolute certainty. And that's the day that Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar the second time. Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar three times. When was the first one? Anybody know the date? I'm hearing it. 600? 605 B.C. 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar has just become king of Babylon. His father, Nabopolassar, has died. He's enthroned as the sole ruler. He goes to war with the Egyptians. And so all of that's happening. And along the way, he conquers Jerusalem because Jerusalem is strategically positioned. If you look at a map of the Mediterranean Ocean, can you see the Mediterranean Ocean in your mind? You know, you've got 
all the nations of Western Europe and you've got Turkey and you've got Israel and you've got Northern Africa, right? Now, if you look at that map in your mind and you go straight across yeah, where the, where, the, where the Mediterranean sort of curves like this, that's where Israel is. Can you see that? You go in a straight line towards the east, that's where Babylon was. Babylon's too big.